Good day guys. Welcome for today's webinar, 7 Habits of a Highly Effective People. There are individual differences. Like in the theory of ice bridge of human life, there are two factors, like character and personality. The character is immovable and takes longer to develop and stay strong even in the harshest of the weather. While the personality can be shed and it can change in itself depends on the environment which is the character reveals what you are inside and the personality shows what you are outside or who you are or what you are to the world. So how we can compare these two factors, the personality and then the character. The character refers to a set of a moral and beliefs that defines how we treat others or how we behave with others in ourselves. It represents how we actually are and this uh, trait is for our mental and moral. So what is it? It is a learned behavior and it's objective in nature, the trait of a person that are abstract and it remains the same. So the validation of the society when it comes to character are required. And for personality, it refers to a range of a distinctive personal qualities and traits of an individual. So it represents who we seem to be. And this is for our personal and for physical traits. So what is it? It is our identity. And it is subjective in nature, the outer appearance and the behavior of a person uh, it can change over time and the validation of the society is not required for their personality. The character endure and distinguish mental and moral characteristic of each individual. It is the only factor which determines our reaction and responses to the given event or the situations. Sometimes it defines the personal behavior and then the thinking styles and controls of the feelings of each individual. It is based on the environment that surrounds us, our mental ability, the moral principles, and similar to the other factors. It is the most precious things possessed by a person and it is evidenced by the limits that she or he never crossed. So while the personality is the combination of our mental behavior and a trace or the qualities of how we think, how we feel, or how we act, so it is a range of our enduring tendency of an individual to think, to feel, and behave in a specific manner of a diverse situation. So it is refers to a systematic arrangement of all these positions like our attitude, the thoughts, or how we feel, and then how we emote in a situation. So it's clear for us that personality and character has a differences, which is the personality reflects on the outer shell, and then the character shows the inner self of us. So when we combine these two, the character and then the personality, the result will be who you are in reality. All of us still on that transformation stage, which is the ongoing process of clarifying our values and making it parallel or aligned with our life timeless principles. Values are guides for human behavior. So these are the basis of who we are and the aspiration of who we want to be and when we're at our best. So these are the aspects and the qualities of us that we hold to be most important. We all have that values but sometimes we disconnect from being that person because of the situation. Your values is your root. The more clear of your values, the more stay connected to your values and to what most important to you. You might have experience or uh, face some tough decisions, but you can make those decisions authentically or genuine in a sense of at peace because you know what is true for you. Principles are not values. While values are the maps, principles are the territory, the ideal to always value the correct principles. So the degree to which we recognize and live in harmony with principles determine if we're moving toward living a principle-centered life or away from it. So the principles are universal truth based on a natural law. While our values govern our behaviors, principles govern the consequences of those behaviors. While values may vary from person to person, principles will always remain constant in the universe. In other words, even though we may have different values, they are governed by the same principles. Finding out our value is a good starting point to every one of us. And it should not be an end in and of itself. What we need to remember is always value the correct principles. In other words, ask ourselves if our values are based on principles. 
If they are not, what is the needed uh, corrective action that we can do? And we have the values that guide our decisions. Things are important and acceptable to us and those that are not. Unless we know what drives us and how we can even begin to understand others around us. Uh, that is not enough. Of course, the end of the goal is to have the practice values based on principles. People have their own standards, perspective, and new sets of ideas. The way how they see the world, the way how they see their roles, and sometimes the way of looking at something. This is what we call the paradigm. If the universe is analogized to a computer processor, a paradigm is like a, an operating system. So the paradigm is a person's frame of reference. A person's paradigm is how we see the world based on all the information that they have gathered and the beliefs that they possess. Example of our perspective. So somehow, some, some of us feel that we're unlovable. You feel lonely and believe that you'll never find a loving partner again. So you might think that if you had someone who loved you, your life would be a lot better. Or maybe you're very outgoing and have a great sense of humor, but inside you're sad and lonely because you secretly feel uh, that you're unlovable. You might go in and out of the relationship because you often settle for that first person who shows interest in you. Or perhaps we believe that you're unlovable because you are overweight and the number of scales determine your value as a human being. So you might think nobody wants you to be a burden with you uh, of someone of your size. And we have to break through our perspective. That's what we call the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is the way on how we see the new world, the way on how we see the new role. So instead of telling that we're unlovable, why don't we tell it ourselves that I love myself and that love comes back to me multiplied. So we have the freedom to feel any way we want about ourselves. So why do you want to belittle yourself sometimes? If you feel unlovable in any way, we have to create new image of ourselves and become emotionally involved with that image by as often as possible. So we have to rethink and feel that it be like to be that person again. Your subconscious mind can distinguish between what's real and imaginary. So get very clear about the image we want to be ourselves. As we go through our day, focus only on what we want, the love, the happiness, the health, and also we have to develop a new way of speaking to ourselves and others. Otherwise, we will sabotage ourselves with a negative self-image dialogue. Another human perspective. Um, the best days are behind me. So the people who are in 35, 40s and beyond, they feel like they already accomplished what they can and there's no enough time for them to start again for a new career, new relationship, or improve their health or accumulate money. Uh, that belief system will hit home for you if you have that some level or you have given up your goals. So it bothers every one of us. And we can change that perspective. We apply that paradigm shift. So if we can know that we live for 100 years, so how we can change our life? Would you, we still feel that we already accomplished everything that we can? Our lifespan is increasing all the time. So we have to expect to be prosperous, happy, healthy for 100 years and beyond. And we have to adopt a new perspective, nothing. There's nothing but good for our life today and in the years to come. So if you feel like uh, your best days are behind you, stop wasting your life and get back in that game and get ready for your next big thing. What happens if you will change your perspective or your paradigm? So what do you see when you look at this illustration? At first, you might see a young lady. However, if you shift your perspective, you will see an old woman. So whatever perspective to be true about the illustration, it's either a young lady or an old woman, it affects on how you think, you feel, or respond to it. That's the power of accepting a new perspective of your paradigm. Or sometimes we have that paradigm or perspective that we need the world's approval. So whenever we want to do something new or we have to look outside of ourselves, 
for validation, we seek for approval. We want to acknowledge, we want guidance from the other workers, friends, clients, or our parents. So we have to look at conditions and circumstances to prove that you're on the right path. So this paradigm is often hard to see because most of us naturally sell our abilities short. Take an honest uh, look at ourselves to see if we need outside approval before going for goals or taking on new things. So we have to break through that perspective and we have to change our mindset for that so we can apply that paradigm shift. So if you think your desire aren't important or we have an image in our mind that ourself are, can, be, can fail, uh, that's a false idea that we must let go of it. So when we have that strong idea to do, we have to create or express something and longing that is divine discontent. It is a spirit that calling us. And we have to answer that call and we will be guided and assured for success. So no matter how many of this paradigm that we can relate to, so we can shift that paradigm into a new way of thinking. That is a paradigm shift. As we walk in this life, uh, we have that basis of applying the values that instill us in our life or in ourselves. So we try to make it align with our life timeless principles. So we have these small decisions in our life that we can make and actions that can perform every day. That's what we call the habit. So we have that knowledge on what to do that or we have that uh, skills on how to do that and we have that desires on uh, yes, uh, we want to do that and yes, we don't want to do that. So those rituals or behavior that we perform automatically are allowing us to carry out essential activities such as taking showers, getting dressed for work, and following the same routes every day. We have that bad habits that is the undesirable behavior patterns or common examples that includes procrastination, fidgeting, overspending, nail biting, or negative thinking. The sooner one recognizes these bad habits, the easier it is to fix them. Rather than merely attempting to eliminate a bad habit, it may be more productive to seek to, to replace it with a healthier coping mechanism. A habit may initially be triggered by a goal. But over time, that goal becomes less necessary and that habit becomes more automatic. Intermittent or uncertain rewards that have been found to be particularly effective in promoting habit learning. Can we assess the habit that we're doing? Sometimes we have the trade-offs between the efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency is about doing things right and then effectiveness is about doing the right things. Some of our habit, we can do it efficient only. So we have that ability to accomplish something, but with at least amount of wasted time, money, effort, and competency in that performance. And sometimes those habits uh, become effective. So there's a degree of something that we successfully produce or the desired outcome, or we become successful in that because we are capable or we are, have that ability to do that things. It's up to us if we will continue that bad habit or just being inefficient but uh, not effective in doing that habit. But we want to change life, right? So we have to shift our paradigm to have the changes in our life to be more effective. We all know how regular bank account works. We make deposits, save up money, and when we need that money later, we will withdraw it. An emotional bank account is an account for trust. Instead of money, it is an account based on how safe you feel with another person. So we have these six ways to make deposit or reduce or withdraw. First is understanding the individual. Keep the commitments. Clarify expectations. Attending the little things or showing personal integrity. Apologizing when we make a withdrawal. So first, in understanding the individual, this means we have to listen intently on what the other persons are saying and empathizing on how they, we, they may feel. It is important to care for the others and act with kindness toward them. So in keeping that commitment, how do we feel when someone arrives right on the time when we have meetings? 
So how about when people simply do what they say they will do? So how we build up an emotional reserve by keeping your commitments? So those questions we can answer. So in clarifying expectation, we are not mind readers. Yes, we consistently expect others to know what we expect from them. We have to communicate out expectations that can help to create a higher level of trust. So when we ask for what we want and what we get it, so we can trust a little more. So in attending a little things, so don't you feel that the little things tends to become the big thing when they do not receive any attentions or our attentions? Doing the little things is how we honor and how we show respect for the others. Somehow, uh, the small kindness, a smile, a little extra effort, a hug, or doing something you didn't have to. These are the things that build trust. And showing the personal integrity. So integrity is the moral floor upon which trusting relationships are built. When we operate with sound moral character, it makes it so easy for the others to trust us. And the last one is apologizing when we make a withdrawal. We will make a mistake sometimes. It's a part of life. But when we see we have violated trust and sincerely apologizing and how we make it deposit to counteract the damage that we have done. So we can try to apologize. We have to say sorry. So we, we, we will make that withdrawal because we want to give the trust or to get the trust purely to that person. We have the degree of maturity. So that is the continued maturity. From dependence to independence and eventually to interdependence. So these are the process of a baby growing up to become an adult. And at the early stage of life, we are all completely dependent on the others to care for us and meet our most basic needs and that continue maturity from dependence that is innate for us and that is a character of us so we need people to do everything for ourselves and we became more independent so that we can do it alone uh, being uh, self-reliant and then we can get what we want through our own efforts and we became more interdependent so we can do it and when we co we can cooperate to others so we have to require the combined efforts to become more successful and effective on what we're doing for the people who are dependent uh, usually they try to avoid responsibility and less complain they blame others tell lies and avoid the consequences of their actions so the dependent people avoid developing essential qualities and skills that support adult long-term happiness. They may demand or manipulate other people to do for them what they will not to do for themselves. And the independent or independence, so these people are being self-reliant, self-empowered, and capable of providing their own needs emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. As we grow older, we begin making progress towards inde independence. In our independent stages of life, we build purpose, direction, and trust for ourselves. We are powerful within our own energy. And we know that we can really or we can rely on uh, to provide for ourselves. So in that interdependence, the people are being a whole balanced person who is able to share with, join in healthy resources of life and others. This facilitates an even greater expansion in life than independent stage. So as we now have unlimited access to even more love, success, and happiness than we could have provided for ourselves. We have the seven habits of a highly effective people. This will be a guide to the process of a personal leadership or a powerful lesson in personal change. First, be proactive. Second, begin with the end in mind. Third, put things first. Fourth, think win-win. Fifth, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Sixth, synergize. And then seven, sharpen the saw. The first three habits are basically character habits, and the next three habits are personality habits. 
First habit is be proactive. Be proactive is taking a responsibility of our own life. It responds the ability or to choose our own responses. Effective people are proactive. Behavior is a product of their own decision based on their values rather than be a product of their own conditions based on the feeling. Being proactive is a habit of a personal vision. So we have that freedom to choose because every individual has a stimulus to response. So we are self-aware and we have that independent will to act on every situation. We have this scenario. So what happened to a bottle of soda when you shake it up? It explodes, right? And what happens to a bottle of water when you shake it up? So it stay calm. If you are proactive, you make things happen instead of waiting for them to happen to you. Active means doing something. A proactive behavior involves acting in advance of a future situation rather than reacting or being reactive. There's a reactive people or as opposed to a proactive people. They blame others for their circumstances. So there are determinism that we so-called that holds back. So why people can't change? Because of their genetic determinism. So their grandparents for their, for their bad temper. So it is genetics or it is uh, from the DNA. So psychic determinism, the upbringing of the particular parents for their shyness or their for being proud. And then the last one is the environment determinism. So their boss or their spouses or their economic situation for having a negative effect on them. That's why they act on that uh, being reactive. So in our lives, there are function of conditioning and conditions. Uh, it's neither the result of a conscious decision or by default because we are by nature proactive. Highly proactive people take responsibility for their lives. Their behavior is a function of their decision, but in not conditions. Uh, whereas the reactive person will be affected by the weather depending on it being a good or bad. A proactive person will not. Whether it rains or shine, it makes no difference to them. Second habit is begin with the end in mind. This is the habit of a personal leadership. So based on imagination, the ability to envision our mind, what we cannot at present see with our eyes. It is based on the principles that all things are created twice. There is a mental or the first creation and the physical second creation. The physical creation follows the mental just as building follows a blueprint. If you don't make a conscious effort to visualize who we are or what you want in life, then you empower other people and circumstances to shape you and your life be default. It's about connecting again with your own uniqueness and then defining the personal, moral, and ethical guidelines within which you can most happily express and fulfill ourselves. So in a state, we decide the direction of our life. Uh, this can advocate us to a different roles that we play in life, and we need to maintain a balance between these roles. So if we know uh, where we are going, so we will know how will we get there. In leadership, it is the art of motivating of a group of people. But in this second habit, we begin with the end in mind. So this habit is for our personal leadership. So we have to motivate ourselves on how we achieve that common goals in our lives. So it means we direct our own selves to that strategy uh, for the needs that we need. In leadership, this is the art of motivating a group of people. But in this second habit, we begin with the end in mind. So this habit is for our personal leadership. Our own self or our own life, we have to motivate or act toward that achieving our common goals. Okay, so we have to direct our own strategies on how we meet our needs. So we become a leader of ourselves. That personal leadership helps us to do things right and it sets our direction, it helps us to 
build an inspiring vision and create something new. So that leadership could help us map our goals in life. What is the difference of leadership and management? Leadership deals with direction, while management deals with the speed, coordination, and logistic on uh, what direction are we going. To begin with the end in mind, so we have to accomplish our goals. We have to mobilize the resources of our personal vision. So combining these two, uh, two factors, the leadership and management. So instead of focusing on our goals, we have to focus on the task, what we're going to do or how we're going to meet our goals. So instead of uh, taking that risk, we have to minimize that risk. Okay, instead of only motivating ourselves to accomplish that goals, we have to approve that goals if that, if that will be fit in our principles. And then, instead of fostering our ideas, we have to assign our tasks for that uh, ideas. The third habit, put first things first. This habit is a personal management. This habit is where habit one and habit two comes together. So, the personal vision and then our personal leadership, which is we have to uh, do that personal management. So, the habit tree is the second creation and then the physical creation. This is the habit of discipline and management of our life as per the direction you have or we have chosen. This habit differentiates between urgent and important. This matrix uh, explains how we prioritize things. So we have this uh, urgent and not urgent and important things and not important things to do. So these quadrants are matching these factors. So we have this quadrant one, which is the urgent and important or important to do. So this task requires immediate attention. In a second quadrant, not urgent but important. So we have to plan. This task needs an action but not immediate attention. In this third quadrant, uh, there's a matching of urgency and not important. So we have to delegate. The task requires immediate action but do not contribute your goals. And then the last one is not urgent and not important. So we have to eliminate this because the tasks are neither important nor urgent. So I give you an example in this habit tree. So we have this time quadrant which has a two factor, the urgent and important. We have four quadrant here. The first quadrant is for the procrastinator because that is due tomorrow and that is urgent and important. So you have to decide to finish it. So you have to decide to do that right away. For example, you have an exam or assignment tomorrow that is due tomorrow. So you have to decide to review and then finish that assignment because that is urgent and important today. Okay, next, the second quadrant. Do for those are for prioritizer. Because we prioritize sometimes uh, to plan and to set goals that is important for that individual but not urgent. But you always do that planning or setting that goals. For example, you have due uh, an assignment for that week. So not urgent, but that is important for you. So you have to do it right away, even that is due for that week. Okay? For example, another thing, your relationship or our relationship. That is not urgent, but it gives you it gives you an importance for every relationship that you have, your loved ones, your family, or your friends. So you always be there for them if they want, uh, if they need your presence. And the fourth quadrant is for the people who are slacker. So they do things that are not important or uh, not urgent. So for example, wasting your time watching TV, wasting your time surfing on the internet, or skipping from those activities. Fourth habit, think win-win. The habit of mutual benefit. Win-win means seeking solution that allows everyone to win. For a successful relationship, uh, it builds on a win-win foundation. So, what is the habit of creating effective interpersonal leadership? In order for us to manage our relationship with others properly, we need to think win-win. This is just a technique that we can apply to every situation of our relationship. 
It's a philosophy, a whole way of thinking and being. Who are those people who think win-win? There is a character that consists of these three traits, the integrity, maturity, and abundance of that mentality. For those people who has that integrity, they are true to their feelings, the values, and then their commitments. For the mature person, uh, they express their ideas and then their feelings with courage and with consideration of the feelings and the ideas of the others. For those who has abundant mentality, they believe that there is a plenty for everyone. They empower people, they don't compare, they don't compete, and they don't criticize. Most of us learn to base our self-worth on comparison and competition. We think about succeeding in terms of someone else failing, that's it. If I win, you lose. If you win, I lose. Life becomes zero-sum game. There is only so much pie to go around. And if you get a big piece of it, there is a less for me. It's not that fair. And I'm going to make sure that you don't get it anymore. We'll uh, play all the games, but how much fun is it really? So we go on in this habit 5. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. People have that selective listening. So we or us sometimes doing it. Paying attention to the only part of the conversation that interests us. We start our own conversation based on what interests us on the other person's conversation. And then the focus becomes us. And then the other person is not being heard and feels unimportant. So this fifth habit is the habit of communication. It, the, it is the deepest need of the human being or the human soul to be understood. Creating understanding is seeking to be understood. So truly understanding, we must listen more than the words. We diagnose before you prescribe and then the empathy of listening with the eyes and through our hearts. In this habit 5, we have to develop that win-win relationship. We must find out what the other parties want and what the winning means to them. We must always try to understand what the other people want and the need before we begin to outline our own objectives. So we must not to argue or oppose what we hear or we do not object. So we must listen carefully and think about it. So we must try to put ourselves in the other party's shoes. As we listen, we prepare our mind what we are going to say and we have that question that going to us. We're going to filter everything that we hear through our life experiences that is supreme of our reference. So you tend or we tend to respond in one or four ways like we evaluate, you judge or we judge then either agree or disagree. We have the proving, listening or proving questions. We ask from our own frame of reference and advice. Sometimes we give counsel, advice and solution to that problem. Sometimes we interpret. We analyze others' motives and behaviors based on that own experiences. In some situation, this response may be appropriate, such as when the other person specifically asks for help from our point of view or when they are already a very high level of trust in our relationship. That's why listening is very important. Sixth habit is to synergize. This is the habit of creative cooperation. Value the differences of each other. It means 1 plus 1 equals 3 or more. The process that reveals the third alternative, which is as, for example, I value other people's strengths and learn from them. So I get along with others, even people who are different than me. I work well in a group. I seek out other people's idea to solve problems because I know that the teaming or with the a teamwork with the others, we can create or I can create better solutions than my own as alone. For the underlying principles of habit 6, the whole is greater than the sum of its part. And then the key paradigm is valuing the differences of the others and seek to create third alternative. For the essence of synergy, we value and respect the differences. So we use the positive energy. And then, uh, many of us haven't that actually experienced synergy in our family lives or in other interactions. Sometimes, we've been shaped into that defensive and protective communication or into believing that life or the other people can't be trusted. 
So therefore, we have the tendency to not open up uh, to these highly effective principles which is requires enormous personal security and openness and spirit of that adventurer. Seventh habit is to sharpen the saw. This habit is a self-renewal. The underlying principles of this is production requires development of production capability. This key paradigm increased the effectiveness through the personal renewal in its different life dimension. So we improve this continuously. In sharpening the saw, it is the act of stepping back when dealing with a difficult situation. For example, whenever you feel stressed, unwanted, or down, sharpening the saw is the way to go. Help ourselves deal with those problems. Habit 7 is all about keeping our personal self sharp so that we can better deal with life. I have a question for you guys. Is that true that what consumes your mind controls your life? But there's a negative things that happen to us. And actually, it really consumes our mind and controls our life. But we don't want to make it happen, right? Because we want to press toward our goals. That's why we have to tell to our past, thank you for those lessons and thank you for those experiences. In this seventh habit, to sharpen the saw, it means preserving and enhancing the greatest assets that we have so that we can tell our future, I'm ready. I'm ready to renew my mind. I'm ready to sharpen the saw. In this self-renewal, we're doing something new again, we're making it fresh and then making us to be strong again. So we have to focus in different dimension of our life. We don't have to neglect the other aspect of our life. So we focus on our emotions, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. We still have time to renew. So take a look on our financial. Are we satisfied with the current and the future financial situations? So what can we do? In our social aspect, can we develop a sense of connection and well-developed support system? Can we deal with the different people? So how can you regain it again? In our occupational, do we have that personal satisfaction and enrichment derived from one's work? Or uh, do you want to have that extra job or extra income for you to attend that one dimensions of your life, which is the occupationals? The other thing is the physical. Can we recognize the need for our physical, the, the activity, the diet, the sleep, our nutrition? So, do we neglect those bad habits when it comes to taking care of our physical body? So, take a look of that. For our intellectual, can we recognize the creative abilities in finding ways to expand knowledge and skills? Or enhancing our thinking skills, learning, continuous learning and studying for us to take care of our intellectual dimensions to learn more things. So take a look at that. For our environmental, good health or occupying pleasant stimulating environments that support well-being. So that's also important. So for our spiritual, can we search for meaning and purpose in this human experience? Do we neglect who created us? Can we ask for a help? If there's a problem that we encounter that we can do something because he can only do something or he can do the greatest thing for us. And then the last one is our emotions. Those developing skills and strategies to cope up with the stress. Are we always stressed? Are we always discouraged? And are we always feel negative? So can we enhance our emotions to renew and to strengthen, strengthen that emotions to cope up with those feelings? So this habit is sharpening the soul. So we have to take a look for that and to regain again. Can we evaluate if we neglect one of the aspects or one of the dimensions in our life? Can we assess? But most of the time, 
we're just focusing on the other dimensions of our life and we neglect the other aspect of our life so this is the time for us to have that habit which is to sharpen the saw we have to go back and renew again I want you to remember the seven habit of a highly effective people be proactive begin with the end in mind put first things first that first three habit is for our character and the other three habit which is think win-win synergize seek first to understand then to be understood is for our personality and all of that should sharpen the soul which is the seventh habit so we have to take a look on the different dimension of our life we have to work on the inside out there are circle of influence and there are circle of our concerns sometimes the circle of our concerns those are the things that we cannot control and for the circle of our influence are those are the things that we can control or change so we have to focus on the things that we can change or influence so we have that sense of security or self-worth so we need guidance because we need that self-direction so we ask for that wisdom uh, to have a good perspective in life and we have that power or capacity to act and to decide some days in the years to come we will be wrestling with the great temptation and trembling under the great sorrow of our life but the real struggle is here now it is being decided whether in the day of our supreme sorrow or temptation we shall miserably fall or fail or gloriously conquer character cannot be made except by steady long continued process so find our voice and inspire others to find theirs